Um, I think it's exactly time. Um, I have great pleasure in introducing today's speaker, uh, Dr. Viren Muti. Uh, some of us have had the privilege of hearing him earlier in Delhi in one venue or another. Um, we can't now work out which of the several <laughs> venues it was. But basically, he's a historian of ideas working on uh, China, Japan, India. His publications, as you will see from the list there, are uh, uh, really rather, rather awesome. And uh, he's currently working, as he says, on Pan-Asianism and the conundrums of post-colonial modernity. Now, uh, as several of you know, in the, um, past, uh, the past week, uh, we had an event called the Giridhishinka Memorial Lecture in honor of one of the founders of ICS and uh, one of the directors of the CSGS. Um, and um, I, for that purpose, I had pulled out a collection of Giri's papers. And lo and behold, what did I find but a, a paper called The Construction of Asia in India. And it begins with a typical uh, Giri bold statement. Now we'll see if uh, this talk uh, bears that out at all. But he said, uh, you know, I, I think this is a really good one to think about, if not to believe it. Before the British rulers told us, we Indians did not know that we were Asians. Okay? In fact, we didn't even know that we were Indians. Having been told that we were Indians, it made some sense, and in some time, and in time, we did something about it. When we were told we were Asians, we didn't know what to make of this Asian connection. In the past, the people of northern and western India were somewhat familiar with the Lyot, the lands from which our Muslim rulers came and to which travelers and traders traveled routinely. The people from India's south also knew about the lands included in the Shiri Vijaya Empire, with which extensive trading contacts existed. Also regimes of conquest, if I'm not mistaken. However, these had never been put together in an inclusive unit. Now that unit has been made even more exclusive by extending it to China, Korea, and Japan. So your two <laughs> are outliers in this, in one direction, the Philippines in the other, and the countries of Central Asia along a third vector. But even today, a well-educated Indian person has difficulty digesting the notion that Siberia, which occupies a third of Asia's land part, is a part of Asia. Well, I'll leave that there, but simply commend this 20-year-old um, uh, uh, adventure in the history of ideas uh, to everyone's reading and ask the speaker to go ahead. Uh, whether or not you've heard of Chang Tai Yen, uh, you will certainly realize, uh, realize what he's talking about and find the connections in this part. Oh, this is good. So, is, uh, yeah, can you can all hear me, right? right. Um, yeah, so first I'd like to thank uh, Patricia for that wonderful uh, introduction. It actually does touch on some of the things I'll be uh, mentioning today. Um, I'd also like to talk uh, to thank uh, the IIC for organizing this event uh, and for Imad who put this together but then is not here right now, uh, Imad Adlika from, uh, from JNU. Um, so um, as you can see, um, the title of my talk is Jiang Taiyan Pan-Asianism and India's Method. Um, and uh, I have quite a bit to go through, so I'm going to move somewhat quickly and then try to open up for questions. Um, just so I'm okay with time, is it 
do I speak for about 15, 15, minutes. 15 minutes and then we're okay. Um, so I'll try and uh, keep to that. So is, I'm going to start with an introduction on which is going to be like what I mean by a Asia, India's method. Um, a second section on Jiang Tayen and early revolutionaries and reformers. Third, the Asia Solidarity Society and Jiang Tayen's meetings with Indians. And then the, third, the fourth part is going to be the most philosophical part of the, uh, of the presentation, which is where we get Jiang Tayen's uh, critique of evolution in Hegel. Um, and what he does there is he brings Yogacara Buddhism and, um, I guess, uh, Chinese Taoism together uh, to confront Hegel. And then finally, I'm going to make, you know, just think a little bit about the relevance of that for the, for the present. Okay. So first, um, some of you might have heard of Jiang Tayen, some of you may not have, so I'm going to say a little bit about him. Uh, not too much. I've written a book about Jiang Tayen. Um, and so some of this draws on that. Um, Jiang Tayen is famous for being an anti-Manchu revolutionary. Um, most of you might know what an anti-Manchu revolutionary is. Um, an anti-Manchu revolutionary refers to, at the end of the Qing dynasty, so the last dynasty, there was a debate, and we'll get into that a little bit, um, about <clears throat> whether the Chinese should overthrow the last uh, Manchu dynasty. Right? So the Chinese are primarily Han, and the, the minor, minority Manchu were ruling. So there was a question of whether you should overthrow the Manchus or modernize within the Manchu dynasty. Right? And so Zhang Taiyan was on the side that said, no, we want to overthrow the Manchus. And that's what he's really famous for. Um, but I'm not going to be discussing that in great detail. He's also a scholar of national learning, and he's also in writing Buddhist political writings. So, what I, in the past, have really focused on, and what I'll talk about at the end, is his use of Buddhism to develop a political theory. Because, in fact, what he does is he uses Buddhism to confront Hegel, to confront the state. He comes up with a whole Buddhist theory. And so this makes him sort of strange, because most people think, how can you be a revolutionary and a Buddhist at the same time? Right? And that's one of the things that, uh, that, that people talk about when they talk about Zhang Um But so, so to just summarize some of the points I'll be making today. So Zhang Tayen invokes India and Yogacara Buddhism to develop a framework beyond Eurocentrism and imperialism. So that's one of the things he wants to do. Um, and there are two parts to his critique of imperialism, both of which I think we can call, um, understand as what I call India as method. And I'm going to talk about what I mean by India as method in a second, because that might be a term that many of you are not that familiar with. Um, so, the, but the two are India as a symbol of anti-colonialism, and the second is uh, Buddhism in India as pointing beyond a Hegelian vision of linear history, which then points to what he thinks of as a new theory of difference, and we'll come to that at the very end of the talk. Okay. So now um, we move to the problem of as method, and this takes us from China to Japan. This takes actually to my second project, the project that I'm doing right now. So. Um, the question we can ask is, what does it mean to say X is as method? And this, the phrase comes from Takeuchi Yoshimi. Um, some of you may have heard of Takeuchi Yoshimi. Uh, he's, uh, there's actually a book by a guy named Chen Guangxing who is called Asia as Method. But the term Asia as Method actually comes from Takeuchi Yoshimi. Um, and uh, he was a post-war intellectual, uh, post-war Pan-Asianist. And uh, during the post-war, of course, Pan-Asianism was not that popular because Pan-Asianism was used for Japanese imperialism, right? So that if you invoke Pan-Asianism in the post-war, you're, you're not in very good company. Um, but the term Asia as method actually comes out of a debate that Takeuchi Yoshimi had um, with another figure named uh, Umesao Tadao. Um, this person is probably not as well known, um, especially not in, East, uh, in Asian studies. Because he and Takeuchi Yoshimi um, had a debate um, about whether Asia is a meaningful category. So this actually gets to some of the comments that uh, Patricia was making. Um, because, um, and, and, and Umesawa was, is the less, I guess, well known now. But at the time, he had a theory of ecological zones that was quite popular because it was also translated into English. 
Um, and he deconstructs the idea of Asia. And he, he's very <coughs> famous for saying, you know, I came to India, I'm Japanese, I come to India, and I feel I have nothing in common with Indians. You know, I, you know, they don't eat the same food, they don't speak the same language, they don't dress like I do. And then he goes to France and he says, well, in France I feel like I feel much more at home in France. So maybe Japan and France, there's actually more in common. You know? um, and so he has a theory of ecological zones where Japan, in terms of ecological zones, doesn't, isn't part of Asia. And the, and, uh, but, but rather, Japan is more like Europe. So, so he and Takeuchi, you've got the Asian side, the side saying, no, no, Japan's Asia, and we should be part of Asia. And then you've got the uh, Umesao Tadao, who says, no, 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 Japan is more like Europe. Right? So he poses a challenge to Takeuchi. He says, well, how can you even talk about Asia? There is so much variety in Asia that it doesn't make any sense to even use the concept. And that's when Takeuchi responds by saying, I'm not talking about Asia just as a, as a simple geographical entity, but I'm talking about Asia as meant. So what does that mean? Well, he explains it this way. Um, and this is a quote that I'll read. He says, the power of Western Europe came into non-Western nations, and many ancient and medieval practices collapsed from the inside. This power was perhaps that of the mode of production, perhaps spirit, but in any case, this movement began with modernity or the establishment of capitalism. If we follow Arnold Toynbee and others, we can say that this was a response to a challenge. The specifics were based on the nature of the challenge and were also based on the particular elements connected to the conditions in various countries. So here he's allowing for the difference, right? But then he says, however, I wonder whether we can stipulate the meaning of Asia based on the form of response. Speaking generally, perhaps we can call Asia the form in which there's an internal movement in the countries colonized by Western Europe or imperialism to become independent and form a nation state. Even if a country is in Asia geographically, if this movement is not present, we should perhaps not call such an Asian, a country Asia. If one gives a recent example, a country such as Israel might be geographically in Asia, but is not Asia. But a country like Cuba is in the Americas. But in terms of form, it approaches Asia. So this, of course, is quite a shocking phrase at the time, uh, and probably still is. I mean, he's basically saying Cuba can be part of Asia. So what Asia, and this is what it means to say Asia is method. Because what it is, is the method for, for constructing an anti-imperialist subject, in some sense. Right? So that's what he's saying. So this is why, you know, He's sort of taking Asia and changing it from a geographical category to, I guess, an ideological or a political category. And I think that's what he wants to do. Um, and that's the idea of Asia's method. Now, the question then we might ask, so, and we can immediately see this is written in the 1960s. Right? So 1961, uh, he's got another essay that I'll, I'll cite from in a second, which is 1960, which is called Asia's method. And you can see that in behind a lot of this is the idea of the third world. So what you have is the earlier discourse of Pan-Asianism that was connected to, uh, you could say, uh, you know, Japanese imperialism and so on. He's taking some of that and then trying to rework that and connect it to the idea of uh, the third world and so on, to where you know you get this the Maoist idea of Latin America, Africa, and, uh, and Asia together. Right. So some of that is. is is echoed here. But there's an interesting question that he also poses, which is, OK, so once we, if we resist imperialism, what should we do afterwards? Right. What do we do? Is it just a question of resistance? And this is where he comes up with an interesting idea, um, where, where there's the idea of searching for an alternative. Um, and he says, rather, the Orient must re-embrace the West. It must change the West itself in order to realize the latter's outstanding cultural values on a great, greater scale. Such a rollback of cultural or values would create universality. The Orient must change the West in order to further elevate those universal values that the West itself produced. This is the main problem facing East-West relations today, and it is at once a political and cultural issue. The Japanese must grasp this idea as well. Okay, so here we get 
a very interesting idea that he um, that is translated as, as rollback, makikaisu. So makikaisu, and some of you, if you know a little Japanese, you can, it's often used in judo. It's where you use the opponent's power to, to topple. So here the idea is to go from within the Western values and twist them free to another kind of universality. So the aim is to create a new type of universality. Okay. So this is the this is one idea of Asia as method. Right? So that I've that we have. So the as method construction as the critique of imperialism and the, the positing of an uh, of a uh, of an alternative. Now. Um, there are responses to this from within the as method discourse. And so I'm going to jump now to a more contemporary period, which is um, where we get to China as method. And this is a, a, a sinologist named Mizoguchi Yuzo, um, who, um, as you can see from the dates, he's, he's later than Takeuchi. And he's critical of Takeuchi. I mean, and I'm not going to get into the whole criticism, because I've written about that in another place. Um, but, but his basic criticism is that um, he wants to say that, well, Takeuchi, in some sense, the, the discourse is still too Western-centric. It doesn't have enough of the actual history of various uh, nation, nations or regions. Um, but that's, that's one issue. But even with the question of as method, which he now changes now to China as method, he then reinterprets as method um, and tries to give a little more um, sort of concrete detail to the idea of a new universality. And we can see that in the following. He says, in the past, the study of China that conceives of China as an end is actually looking at China through the world as method. In other words, using the world as a standard to measure China, it is only that this world is, in fact, Europe. The world that conceives of China as method is a multiplied world, in that China is an element of its composition. In other words, Europe is also an element. Now clearly, um, when you read this, you can immediately see what the, 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 the more recent text that immediately echoes to me is, is uh, the Pesh Chakrabarti's Provincializing Europe. Because what he's basically doing is saying you want to take Europe from the center and make it only another element. And then through that, you construct a new type of universality. Right? So that universality is not going to be grafted from the outside, but rather from the various particular histories, you're going to then develop a new type of universality. So it's a way of trying to go beyond the opposition between universality on one, side, on one hand and particularity on the other. So there's, this becomes the issue. And this is something that I'm going to try to get at through John Tainan as well. So now we've had the two as-method formulations. We've got the Mizoguchi as-method, which is a way of developing a universality that goes beyond the opposition between universality and particularity. And you have the Takeuchi as method, which is basically a critique, um, a, a critique of imperialism. <laughs> so let us now recapitulate. So what I'm saying with this, why I brought these two Japanese people into the conversation, is that I'm going to say that Zhang Tanyan's engagement with India anticipates the above two as, as method form, formulations, but focuses on India. So. I'd also like to add that his engagement with Hegel is especially interesting in light of a recent work that stresses Hegel's own fascination with, with India. You might know the book by uh, Mohapatra and, and Rathore, which is, uh, which is about it, it basically a collection of all of Hegel's writings on India. And it seems quite interesting that he was really interested in India and constantly wanted to develop a critique of it. Um, now, Hegel's view is that India does not allow, or, or the Orient more generally, doesn't allow for difference. John Tayen is going to change that, and he's going to say, no, no, the problem is it's, it's Hegel that doesn't allow for difference. And we'll look at that argument in a second, uh, towards the end, rather. Okay, so now we're now moving back to early 20th century China. Okay, so, so just to get, to get our historical bearings back. Um, now, um, in the early 20th century context, um, so that we're talking about the late Qing, for those of you who the Qing dynasty ends in 1911, so the last, the late Qing is usually considered from anywhere from the Opium War all the way to, to 1911. And what you have during that period um, is um, um, a number of changes, right? Because you begin to get this feeling, previously, remember, Chinese thought of themselves at the center of the universe. You probably know this discourse. Um, 
And then what happens is they get decentered through imperialism, through, well, the, the, the opening war and so on, right? Um, you also have the Sino-Japanese War, which was a major, which was perhaps even more um, psychologically uh, jarring for the Chinese, right? Because you have what a, a nation that was sort of more on the, sort of on the periphery of their tribute system. And even the global opinion was that the, the Chinese were going to win this war, but in, in the end they didn't. And so then what happened was once they lost, there was a constant sort of retaking stock about China's own position in the world and how to understand space and time and all of these things. Um, now, you get, you can see sort of here a, a kind of visual look at the maps of the period. There's this constant fear that China is going to be sort of carved up. The, in fact, the term, the Chinese term is guofen, sort of carved up like a, men, uh, like a melon, right? Um, this is the same thing, but you also have the actual European powers sort of coming them up. And so the, the, the argument from one group, um, and a fairly um, large group, was that you know what we have to do is modernize. We've got to modernize in order to save ourselves. Right? Um, and um, Kang Youwei would be one of those. Remember, in the um, beginning of this talk, I talked about the difference between revolutionaries and reformers. Right? So Kang Youwei is probably one of the most famous reformers. Right? So he wants to say that what China has to do is it, ha it shouldn't overthrow the last dynasty, the Qing dynasty, um, but what it should do is develop a constitutional monarchy. It should develop, uh, it should modernize under that dynasty. Right? So that's his, his argument there. And he's sort of, in many ways, you take Kang, Kang Youwei and Zhang Taiyan, and then they're sort of like, um, you know, they're, they're the two, they represent the two positions. Right? The, the, so they're, they're sort of mutually each other's nemesis, because you've got the, the most famous reformer and maybe the most, most famous revolutionary. Now, it's at this time, um, and this again comes to some of uh, Patricia's earlier mar remarks, because it's at this point where you get um, these people like Kanye Wei also becoming interested in India. Um, so he claims that you know we need to reform within the um, Qing government. He claims that the only country to modernize is, is Japan, uh, and so this is where this is where you really look at Japan. Um, and he says India is important because it shows what could happen to China. Now, what's interesting is that um, Kang Youwei actually comes to, to India. I think he goes to Calcutta, um, and um, you know he 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 has he writes about India in, in, in travel logs and so on. And he basically has two points. Uh, one is he wants to say that this is what's going to happen to China if it doesn't reform, right? If it doesn't modernize. So here's two quotes. There. Um, one from his student, actually, Yanchi Chao. He says, formerly India was cel a celebrated nation, but stuck to her traditions without changing. So during the Chen Long reign, the British organized a company with a capital of 120,000 ounces of gold to carry on trade with India and eventually subjugated the five parts of India. Now notice that you have the five parts of India. So that's going to be the other part. That's uh, the other issue that he's going to say. The problem with India is it's not united. So he's going to be very much for the unity of China, and that's why he doesn't want revolution. Because he said, you have revolution, you overthrow the government, the, um, the foreigners are going to come in and, 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 and you know, all take a piece of China. Um, now, his student, Nang Chi Chao, says something very similar. Um, again, it's the stubbornness of sticking to tradition. So this idea of reform. Now, the idea of reform here is not just about politics, but it also, it's, there's also a politics of time. Um, because these judgments coalesce with an evolutionary perspective, which is what um, Kang Youwei also has. Um, he also, he's also one of the people who really promoted that, which is this idea that all nations are evolving, and there's a question of how fast, you, if you don't evolve fast enough, you're going to be uh, discarded, right? So it's a little bit like Darwin's, uh, you know, social Darwinism, which was getting to be quite popular at this period. Um, so India is what happens to you when you don't, uh, when you don't evolve. Now, now I'm going to move to the other side very quickly because um, I want, the focus is Jiang Tian, and this is really the other side. But um, you'll notice what I want what I want to do in this section is not so much get into Jiang Tian's more critical works, but to show that the revolutionaries uh, like Zhou Rong, maybe the, one of the most famous uh, revolutionary, and that is a, 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 a photograph of his 
famous book called Gomintrun or the uh, Revolutionary Army, which uh, was uh, a pamphlet to promote anti manchu sentiment. So the revolutionaries were also um, really supporting evolution in some ways. So look at this. You've got the text um, of speaking of, um, which is like a really famous revolutionary tract that says, you know, it begins with a sentence that advocates cleansing ourselves of 260 years of harsh and unremitting pain so that the descendants of the Yellow Emperor will all become Washingtons. Now, this is a really interesting issue, right? Because what you have is as China modernizes, it may cease to be China. I mean, that's, the, that's going to be the tension, of course. And, and here we can think about, um, you know, the whole problem of nationalism and the way nationalism has to cut in two different ways. On the one hand, it has to show that it's really modern. On the other hand, it has to go and show how old it is at the same time, right? And, that, and that's a, a kind of tension. Um, now, the text also speaks of the universal principle of evolution. Um, and so this is, this, is a, this is another way in which you have evolution. And Zhang Kaiyan at this point, so at this point in his career, he follows this. And he says, you know, he's, all, he's also affirming Japan, right? And he wants to say Chinese and Japanese are of the same race. Um, he also writes the preface to Zorong's tract and it endorses uh, Zhou's ideas. Right? But there's a big change that happens around 1903. Um, because uh, after they write this tract, they are both thrown in prison um, because this is considered a very seditious tract. There are lines in this tract that are crit critical of the Qing emperor at the time and so on. Um, and of course, you're advocating the overthrow of the Qing government, so uh, it's not a surprise that they are thrown in jail. But they're thrown in jail in, um, in Shanghai, where the British have extraterritoriality. Um, so this is the famous Subao tri trial. And uh, Zhang Tayan spends three years in jail, and that's when he starts reading Yogacara Buddhist texts. In fact, um, Zhou Rong dies in 1905. Um, and Zhang Tayan says one of the reasons why he could survive is precisely because he was reading Yogacara texts. So there's something about the Buddhist um, sort of, I guess, ideas and cosmology or the philosophy that enabled him to transcend his, his situation, is what he, what he claims. Um, but in any case, um, there are other changes that are taking place with, with respect to Pan-Asianism, right? If we want to talk about after the Russo-Japanese War, uh, sorry, the, the Sino-Japanese War, you now have the Russo-Japanese War, which again is extremely symbolic in Asia. Why? Because for the first time you've got an Asian country, the Japanese, who are beating up the Russians, right? They're beating up the whites. So this had reverberations all over Asia. Um, you can, of course, it's, most of you will probably know you have, you have even Tagore writing about this a little, a little later. Um, but take a look, for example, at this uh, Ahmad Raza, an Ottoman Empire intellectual, right? And he says, you know, once you have the Russo-Japanese War, we no longer can say, you know, that the, the Asian races are sort of inferior. We also can't even, we've also proved the Christian world arrogant. Uh, he basically then wants to say, you don't need these interventions from Europe, uh, right? That's what Japan has shown. On the contrary, he said, now the most isolated and preserved from contact with European invaders and plunders of people is, the better is the measure of its own evolution towards rational re renovation. So what he's now basically saying is, we can all have our own paths, and that's what Japan has shown. Of course, this is still an evolutionary kind of discourse, um, but still it's now trying to delink itself from Europe. Now, um, but the problem is that Japan's relation to Asia is quite complex. Because at the same time that Japan is now the symbol of, of Asian resistance, it's also making these treaties with, uh, with, with, with England and so on, and saying, you know, we'll recognize you know, your territories if you're in India, if, if you recognize Japan's territories. So that now is going to suddenly make Japan not so, um, sort, sort of, so much of a kindred spirit for the Pan-Asian. Uh, and so Japan is going to be sort of conflicted, uh, and, 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 J and Jiang Taiyan is going to definitely perceive this. Now, Jiang Taiyan flees to Japan after he gets out of jail, so 1906, because most people say, okay, you're out of jail, but it's still going to be dangerous for you to be in China, you should go to Japan. So he goes to Japan, and he's in this period of the boom of Pan-Asianism, but he's also in the period where Japan seems to be all, you know, betraying the cause, so he's, in a, he's in, a, in, a, in a somewhat of a difficult situation. Um, he goes in Japan, he's the editor of this famous revolutionary journal, which before Sun Yat-sen was also part of, and he was, you know, was part of it for a while. And it's called, uh, it's called Minbal, or the People's Journal. 
that's one of the, uh, the, the first editions. If you look at this journal, it's also, it also says something about the ideology, right? So it says you've got to establish a republic. So that was the basic um, goal of the revolutionaries, right? Establish a re republic, overthrow the, um, the Manchu government, right? Um, and then it says, um, you know, nationalized land. I think that is the socialist dimension of this, uh, of this, of this group, the revolutionaries. Unite the Chinese and Japanese. I think this is partly because they're in Japan. Ensure that the various countries of the world, in the world, approve of the Chinese revolution. Now, and this would be, this is the basic ideology that's printed in all the, uh, the, the issues. Right? So now we'll move to the, we'll move to the Asia Solidarity Society. Uh, which is happening around the same time. So this is where um, Zhang Taiyan at meetings, he, he's around the same time as he's editing uh, Min Bao. He's at this group um, of Asian intellectuals that unite in what is called the India House. Uh, and it's called the India House, it's, it's in Tokyo, because um, there were a number of freedom fighters who fled India and stayed there. So that again is an interesting story because Japan was not the government was not protecting these Indians, so they, they would often have to be harbored by various revolutionaries or, or you know, Japanese intellectuals. I mean, the most famous of these is probably Raj Bihari Bose, because he stayed with Okawa Shumei. That's another person I'm working on in another, um, in another uh, project or another paper. Um, and um, so Zhang Taiyan is in the early stages of this, um, of this kind of uh, this kind of pan-Asianist uh, movement. Now, the Indian, India House itself is a transnational institution where Indian radicals and exiles would get together. So, for example, in 1910, there were India Houses in London, Vancouver, and so on. But the Tokyo India House is probably, in some sense, it's, it's part of this larger conglomeration, but mediated differently because it was in Asia and could be a meeting place for Asian radicals, right? Um, now, Jiang Taiyan then wrote the Constitution, along with another guy named Jiang Ji, who's another uh, re sort of revolutionary. And I want to read the Constitution, because there's a lot of interesting uh, points in that, especially with respect to how he now re-narrates India and Japan. Um, so first, the opening is fairly straightforward. He says, among the various countries, India has Buddhism and Hinduism. China has the theories of Confucius, Mencius, Lao Tzu, Chuang Tzu, and Yang Tzu. Then moving to Persia, they have enlightened religions such as Zoroastrianism. The various races in this region had self-respect and they did not invade one another. The various islands in the south are influenced by Indian culture. The people from the eastern seas are all influenced by Chinese culture. They rarely invaded each other and treated each other respect respectfully. Now, this, what's interesting here, of course, is that he's constructing a primal scene. Now, this is not that it's not something with, well, was there, were there no invasions in Asia? I mean, that would be, uh, it's, a, it's a sort of strange claim to make. But we can understand why he's making the claim, and I think that's what I'm interested in, because he wants to put a kind of primal scene that is not just of the past, but of the future, right? He posits that past because he wants to say, once we get rid of the West, we can go back to that, right? And I think that is, the, that is what he's thinking of, of a, of a world where there is no imperialism, right? And he posits that. Um, in, in the beginning, but then notice that he connects it to India and China. So India and China are going to be very important in this whole thing. Um, then, of course, um, then he says, look what happens with imperialism. He says, about a hundred years ago, the Europeans moved east and Asia's power diminished day by day. Not only was their political and mil military power totally lacking, but the people also felt inferior. Their scholarship deteriorated and people only strove after material self-interest. India fell first, and then China was lost to the Manchus. The group of Malaysian islands was occupied by the whites, and so on. And once they're going to, they, they start all falling, right? Now, there are a number of very interesting things here, especially if you compare it to Kang Yowei. Remember, Kang Yowei said, why is India important for us? India is important for China because it, that India could become China, or China could become India, rather, sorry. Um, because India has fallen, we could also, that could be our future. Now, he can say that because he's a reformer. He thinks that the Manchus are Chinese. But notice for him, China was lost to the Manchus. So China and India for, for, for Jiang Taiyan are already the same. India is a victim of British imperialism. China is a victim of Manchu 
So there's a sense in which there's more of a reason to unite for, for, for John Tyler. Now, the other thing, of course, is this problem of feeling, right? There's the problem of the experience of feeling inferior, which he also wants to combat, right? And he thinks that, so this is where you can, I almost talk of it of, as a kind of post-colonial moment, because it's the problem is not just resistance, but it's the problem of rethinking who you are. Right? And I think that's going, to be, that's going to be an issue that's going to become clearer when we get to the last section. Okay. So now you get analogies with the Asia ancient past. I'm not going to get into this in great detail, but this is something that Chinese intellectuals often did, which was to say that international relations happened in China in the ancient period. So um, when in the period when China is not unified. So it could be the pre-Qin period or whatever. So he wants to say, he wants to talk actually about the ninth century where China was trying to fight the barbarians and didn't, and didn't work. It didn't really fight the barbarians. Uh, yeah, successfully, and if that doesn't, if that happens again, we're going to be in trouble. So he says, so basically, because the, the imperialists are the barbarians, he's saying, right? So he says, learning from the experience of Tianshan, we established the Asian Solidarity Society in order to resist imperialism and protect, protect our nation states. Okay, and then what we have to do here, and this again is this, the problem of thought and culture, right? Revitalize Hinduism, Confucianism, etc and to squeeze out the Western superficial morality. Now, similarly, then we get strategic res resistance at the very end of the Constitution. It says, we will lead the sages to involve being conquered by the whites. We will not follow separatism, and we shall not bow to form. All our close friends of several different types have not completely united. First, India and China must form a group. The two old countries of, East, of the East are huge, and if they can be fortunate to obtain independence, they will form a shield for the rest of Asia. The remaining dozen neighboring countries can therefore avoid being bullied. So this is what's so important. Notice that previously he was saying China-Japan at the center. Now it's become China-India. And the hope is that once China and India unite, then maybe Japan will come in as well and then we can get, because remember, remember when I said, uh, when we looked, if you look at the, the beginning, I said that there were intellectuals from Burma and all these places. There's one group that didn't, uh, didn't come, and that's the Koreans. Because by this time, Korea has already been annexed by Japan, and so you have, the, you know, there's a, there's a lot of animosity already um, towards the Japanese. And I think what's very important here is to see that the way in which Jiang Haiyan sees the uni unity of China and India in Asia could transform the rest of um, the, the dynamics in Asia. Okay, so during the same period, Jiang interacted with some Indian freedom fighters who wrote about his encounters. Um, he writes about two intellectuals, and one of the big problems is we're not really sure who both of these are, uh, because we only have their Chinese names. And um, they are, uh, he says one is Bolo Han. <laughs> so Mr. Bolo Han had come to Japan from the United States, and he visited me in the Minbao editorial offices. He said the treatment meted out to Indians by the British government was far worse than that of the Mughal dynasty of earlier times. Those who set their minds on learning have been unable to study politics and law, even if they go overseas to produce their st uh, studies, pursue their studies, um, they still feel under strict prohibition and so on, right? And then he talks about Bao Shan, who's the, who speaks Japanese, and, and, and obviously the commuting. So, so it's interesting that the Indians and Chinese are communicating in Japanese with one another, um, and sometimes through, the, through, a, through a translator. Um, now, these are, this is what some people, a friend of mine named Lin Xiaoyang um, at Hong Kong says, believes that this is, these are the two Indians. Mohamed Barkatullah, uh, who was involved in organizing pan-Islamic and pan-Aryan movements. Now he was in the United States, but the problem I have with this is that Barkatullah came to Japan in 1909. I'm not so sure whether um, this is him. It, the other thing is, uh, one of the things that they really do very famously is they attend a uh, meeting about Shivaji in Tokyo. And I'm not so sure whether Barkatullah as a pan-Islamist would be that interested in the Shivaji, but, but it could be. I mean, so, so Surendra Mohan Bose, on the other hand, I'm pretty sure this is right, because he was the, one of the founders of the, of the, uh, of the India House. He was, uh, he was, he was there. Um, so one of the things that um, John does in these writings about India and Indians is to criticize Japan and, and evolutionary think, thinking, which was, of course, very popular in Japan. You might even know from Fukuzawa Yukichi. So he, he criticizes the Japanese polit politician, Okuma uh, Shigeno, um, who praised the British rule of India. 
and this is what he says, and John counters saying, you know, since the Russo-Japanese War, the Japanese have become extremely proud and believe that they are great, the great dragons of the East. They see India as already gone. They defeated China in a war, and they annexed Korea without a fight. Before Japan arose, there were minor skirmishes in Asia, and it was, it was relatively peaceful. Now it, is, now it is the opposite. So now notice that Japan is almost, you can almost see like with Takeuchi, you can have a country that moves out of Asia. It's almost like Japan is now out of Asia. He's saying the same things he's saying about the West, he's saying about Japan. Um, the other thing, of course, is the critique of the very discourse of civilization. Uh, and this, this, of course, might just remind some of, of Gandhi's later uh, uh, famous phrase. But uh, he says, we should know that the more civilization advances, the more it tramples humanity underfoot. It has already taken our children and destroyed our homes. Um, generally speaking, civilized countries clog up people's eyes and ears with false morality. And then the French treat the Vietnamese people like domesticated animals, the English treat the Indians like beggars. Mm -hmm. So what he sees here is the criticize. What he wants to do is a critique not just of, of, of I guess, um, civilization and imperialism, but a certain logic of civilization that, if you, that even leads to imperialism. And that's something he, will, he does uh, using his Buddhist text. I'm not going to get into that in, in great detail, um, but, I've, but I've talked about that elsewhere, so I'm happy to discuss it. Um, okay, and then, of course, he wants to talk, even when you talk about imperialism, the idea of race is very important, he says, right? Because he says you can have independence and everything, but there's still going to be the problem of the racial line. He says, like, take the American black man. Um, you know, he's, he might possess the franchise and name, but in fact, he's not equal, right? He can't escape being lynched and so on. It's, it's a similar kind of thing. You can't expect, this is where the idea of subjectivity becomes very important. You need to have the subjectivity of um, independence. And this is where, again, India's method becomes important, because he says, you have that subject, subjectivity in India. So he's, what he's saying is India represents the place that resists imperialism. Um, so it's very different from, um, from, from Kanye Wei, where India represents the place that was lost to imperialism. So it's, it's here, it's no, 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 India represents resistance to imperialism, right? And you notice there's the strategy of organizing strikes, boycotting commodities, and you also have solidarity amongst various villages. So you've got, notice that the, the way in which this this confronts both imperialism and capitalism to some extent, right? Because what you have are strikes and commodities are the two things that he, that he points out. Um, okay, so now coming to the final section of the, to of the talk, which, was, which is going to be the most difficult because it's going to get into some phil philosophical issues. Um, because one of the things that Zhang Kaiyan does is he goes back to um, Yogacara uh, Buddhism and Zhuangzi, and he wants to bring these two together. So it's almost like what I would call a philosophical Chindia. Um, and now there's been recently a bunch of people talking about Chindia, but I think this is, he's one of the, he doesn't use the term, but what he wants to do is take Yogacara, which is called uh, basically the, the idea of the Vinyapati Madhva, which is consciousness only, right? And, and we don't have to go into the details of that, but he then wants to say that, uh, and, and this, this, is the, this is a period where a lot of people were, were into Yogacara Buddhism. Because a lot of uh, Chinese intellectuals in the late Qing were bringing Yogacara because they thought it could grasp Western thought. So here was an Asian idea or an Asian body of thought that they thought could come into dialogue with people like Hegel, Kant, and so on. Right? Because, because they all stress consciousness. Right? German idealism also stresses consciousness. Right? So that, that was the background. But what, where Zhang Taiyan is very different is he wants to take Yogacara and attack um, well, some of Western thought. And, well, you could say most of Western thought that he knew. But, and, and Hegel is going to be one of the people he constantly criticizes. Um, now, we, well, he, he obviously, John, John Tayen couldn't read German and he couldn't, you know, I, I think he was reading Hegel primarily in Japanese. Um, but Hegel himself, of course, has a lot of writings on him and, and clearly and writings on, on, on the Orient. And notice what he says. He says, the Oriental world has as its closest principles the substantiality of ethical life. We have the first example of the subjugation of an arbitrary will which is merged in this substantiality. So basically what you have, according to him, is you have the, the Oriental world is one in which you do not have difference. You have one substance and you don't have individuality. So individuality gets crushed, right, according to him. Spirit eventually develops further, right? Substantiality for Hegel is also a good thing because it can be community, it can be all these things. 
you need them, but you need it mediated with the will. So you need both. And that's what um, Hegel thinks eventually develops. Um, notice that he discusses, you can see this problem quite clearly in this in the philosophy of history, where he says, since spirit has not yet attained, attained interiority, it wears the appearance of spirituality, spirituality still involved in the conditions of nature. Since the external and the internal, law and moral sense, are not yet distinguished, still form an undivided unity, so also do religion and the state. The constitution is generally a theocracy, and the kingdom of God is, the, is to the same extent also a secular kingdom, as the secular kingdom is also divine. So, to put things simply, you do not have the separation of church and state. You don't have you know, what, what, what we might associate with liberal institutions. I'm not saying Hegel is a liberal, but he does want to have that, that, se that separation, and, and which is why he'll, he'll write about civil society and so on. Um, but this, what I want to argue, what I, what I claim, and I think what, this is where Johnny Tayen is going as well, is that this, this political problem is connected to a metaphysical issue. He says, and this is again Hegel, he says, everything depends here on a correct understanding of the status and significance of negativity. If it is taken only to be the determinants of finite things, then we are thinking of it outside of the absolute substance. And we have allowed finite things to fall outside it. Imagination maintains them outside of absolute substance. Now this might be the, the, the quote of the day for today. Um, because, um, the, but, but the idea is quite, is quite is, is, is fairly simple once you get a, you, you understand what he's saying. Because what he's saying is that what you have in Asian philosophy is you have the idea of absolute substance. Um, but the problem is, and you might have negativity. For example, and this is Hegel's example. You have Brahman, and you have everything else being Maya. Right? But the problem is, so, so everything else gets negated, but this actual substance doesn't. So what you end up having is the substance that is going to squish everything else, which is why he's going to say you don't have um, a movement. That you don't have difference. You don't really have history. Um, so basically, you have absolute versus finite particulars. Now, um, this is not Hegel's. This is not only Hegel's critique of Indian uh, or, or, or Asian thought. This is also his critique of Spinoza. If, if some of you are familiar with Hegel, right? he says that's why he says omni determinatio negatio es, right? because he's really thinking of Spinoza. He says Spinoza is the one who's in the West done this, done the same thing. Right? Um, and um, what happens then is you get a night in which all, all cows are black, right? because. What you have is one thing that has reality, everything else, uh, everything else doesn't. And what he wants to say, my system is very similar, but actually I have neg negativity in both. So that's going to be his, his argument. Um, now, Hegel's writing, of course, you have to put them in context. He was writing against other Germans who were writing about India. And they were people saying that, you know, India is going to be the answer, right? Or, or, or Asia is going to be the answer. He's, so he's very much against that romantic trend, right? And they were criticizing reason and the enlightenment and so on. And he wants to say all these people think about Schelling. He's really thinking partly about Schelling and, and, and others. Schlegel, I guess, is another person. Now, now coming back to the late Qing, because we have to remember, we can't just take Hegel and then talk about the late Qing. We have to realize that Hegel was interpreted in the late Qing. There are Chinese writing about Hegel. Um, let's take a look at this. This is the late Qing Hegel. And he says, this is a, this is a student of Kang Yawei. And, and, and this is where Hegel himself is interpreted as obliterating differences, right? He says, Sell, since all things such as state families and countries do not have the goal of developing the individual, but only of developing the great spirit of the world. This is exactly, in some sense, what Hegel disagrees with. But what's interesting is this is interpreted as a good thing, right? According to Hegel, the myriad things are equal as one, right? Uh, socialism and cosmopolitan take equality and so on, they can be de deduced from Hegel's theory. This he's thinking of, of as a good thing. And this is what Zhang Taiyan is going to be attacking. Um, so now Zhang Taiyan is going to d use Buddhist ideas of karma to explain evolutionary disaster. So he wants to say, I'm not going to criticize the idea of progress itself, but I'm going to say progress is actually disaster. And we can get into that argument, but it has to do with this, his concept of bijas, or, or, or the karmic seeds, where he says that what happened, that's how he can, begins to try to explain modernity. I have another paper on that. Um, but I'm going to just give you the punchline. And so this is, this is what he says. This is how he describes Hegel's theory. He says, some steal Hegel's theory of being, non-being, 
and becoming and believe that the universe emerged because of telos, and hence only things that accord with this goal are correct. If we take the universe not to have any knowledge or consciousness, then there is originally no goal. If we take the universe to have knowledge and consciousness, then it is as if this peaceful and happy self suddenly created the myriad things to bite into itself. It is as if it eats without stop, and in the end the harms of a parasitic worm emerge so that the universe repents. Sometimes one thinks of how one can use laxatives such as lilac, daphne, and croton to get rid of these things. So the goal of the universe is perhaps precisely this repentance about becoming. How can one be happy about it? So, this is what he's saying is basically, hey, the whole idea of progress, he says, is like a freight train to disaster. Right? And we can think of this he's writing in the early 20th century. When we look at the early 21st century, it looks even more. I mean, think about the environmental and so on. Um, so it's only, he's sometimes really prescient, um, because he's writing at a time when everybody is actually going on the modernization train. And he's saying, no, 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 it's actually, we should actually develop an alternative. And it's this, he's saying, that is going to suppress difference. Um, no, and he's going to come up with an alternative, and he says, with to Hegel, right? And he says, so he said, he, he himself is saying, Hegel and, and, and Asian thought, especially Chinese and Japanese thought, are very similar, but, uh, sorry, Chinese and Indian thought, uh, are, are very similar, but there's a, a subtle difference. So he says, there is, so there is no correct place, there is no correct taste, color, it lets each thing be what it wants. This is what he says is strong. The understanding cannot grasp the extent to which this surpasses the universal principle. Remember, we talked about the universal principle of evolution and so on. Chuanzu says, all things are so, all things are permissible. Wu hurang, wu the literal, The literal meaning of this phrase is the same as Hegel's. All events are in, are in accord with principle, all things are virtuous and beautiful. This, I think, is this <coughs> translation of the real is the rational, the rational is the real, but it's translated a little funny. Um, however, the former takes people's hearts and minds to be different and difficult to even out, while the latter posits a final end, which is the process by which things are realized. So now, he's, in some sense, this is another way of turning Hegel on its head, because he's saying it's Hegel who's not allowing difference, right? Um, and, it's, it, and it's precisely because of his, his, his teleology, because he's able to have motion. Remember, Hegel's problem with all of these philosophies is it doesn't move, that there's not, there's not the motion. So, there's, so then, he, then he writes a whole treatise to discuss this one idea that he's mentioned. And it's called A Discussion on the Equalization of Things. And this is where I see the, phil the philosophical chindia. Um, and so now I'm coming to the, to the very end. Um, so if we read this text, uh, it's quite interesting. The very, the very first text, the very first line, is again talking about equality. Because remember, we saw how the other Hegelian, the Chinese Hegelian, is saying, everything is equal as one, right? So he says, I'm going to talk about what equality is, and it's a Chinese character named Qi Wu, which, which we can talk about. But he says, equalization things uh, is absolute equality. If we look at its meaning carefully, it does not only refer to equality among sentient beings, such that there is no inferior or superior. It is only when one is detached from words, detached from speech, detached from the mind taking objects as its causal conditions, that one understands absolute equality. OK. so. This, this passage is very interesting because it's, it's a citation within a citation. I'm citing Zhang Tayen. But, San, but Zhang Tayen is citing a Buddhist text called The Awakening of the Mahayana Faith. How many of you have heard? You, you, many of you have probably not heard of this text. Because it's very interesting because it really is a Chindia text. Because it is a text that is translated into Chinese, but we can't find the original Sanskrit. So most people think it's a forgery. So it's probably a text that's fabricated in China to look Indian, right? Um, and so what Zhang does is cite this text, probably thinking it's an Indian text. Um, but he doesn't cite the whole thing. He doesn't cite this one, there is one, there's nothing but one mind, and for this reason, and so on. So he doesn't want the oneness. He wants to affirm the difference, right? And that's, and that, that's also a, in, interesting to note. So then he's going to get Zhuangzi and, and, and Yogacara both becoming um, it's kind of affirming a different type of difference. And, and going back to Mizoguchi, a different type of universality. So he says famously, this is a really famous passage, to equalize the unequal is the way of the lowly scholar. To create equality through difference are the wor words of the mysterious philosopher. So this is um, the theory, but then he wants to ex explicate it further. 
And this is where, again, it gets a little bit difficult. He says, citing from the Chuangzi, one only uses traces to guide transformation. Without words, nothing can appear. Words have the nature of returning. Thus, one uses words to signify things. This is what is said in the following passage from the Chuangzi. In speaking, there are no words. One speaks one whole life, and one has never spoken. One does not speak throughout one life, and one has not, never stopped speaking. So this, again, could be the quote of the day. But, um, but, but this is uh, what he's trying to say here, is develop a new theory of language and difference uh, through using Yogacara Buddhism to confront Hegel. Right? Um, and not just Hegel, but, all, but a lot of the, the, the people in the, uh, in, in the Lei Ching who were talking about evolution and so on. And you can think about, well, what is he meaning? He's talking about a, a different way of using language. You can almost think about uh, language and meaning, which, some, which a lot of people have thought about, where meaning is abstract. But language can be, can be used to articulate difference in different ways. I mean, you can think about speech, sound, and language, a different, a different way of gesture. Um, some have thought of him as maybe talking about poetic language. But given that there's a Buddhist text, um, what you have is a, 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 a way of inscribing difference beyond our ordinary use of language. Politically, this could res resemble a new type of universality, where the concrete singularity of each is the condition for the possibility of the flourishing of all. Think again about um, the famous, the, the Mizoguchi uh, ideal of developing universality through particularity. Right. So that could be that. I think is, is, is what he's getting at. And the the Buddhist analogy for this is, of course, in the in the Resnet, right, where you have each part being particular, but is but but gets its meaning through the 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 kind of interconnectedness with the whole. Now the question is, how do we create a world like this? Now a world like this, he says, would be one that has no nation states. He's got a famous essay called On the Five Negations. And the five negations are no nation states, no, no uh, groups, no government. He was an anarchist for a while. Um, and uh, eventually, of course, no self and so on. And that is some of the Buddhists. So, it's, so he's really pushing Buddhism to a kind of political ideal. And he says that it's what it's going to be is a new type of utopia um, that that you know he thinks goes beyond the socialists at the time. But at the same time, remember, so this would be maybe the Mizoguchi side, but it's even beyond Mizoguchi because Mizoguchi was still thinking a lot about in, in nations. Um, now, if you talk in this terms, of course, many people were were like, but how can you still be a revolutionary, right? Uh, because he's a revolutionary and in some sense a nationalist. And so what then he says is, we can't realize this directly. The anti the anti-colonial struggles have to be have to see this as the distant future. So that the nation state emerges but then it has to self-negate. Right? Um, so there is so if he so he says that there's an ideal world but beyond nations and so on, but he believed that the only way to achieve this is paradoxically through anti-imperialist national struggle. And so this is where the, the there's the there is a method in which India and China embodies this, right? While it also represents the philosophy of its overcoming. Okay. Okay. So now I'm just going to end with just some questions about well, what does this mean for us today, right? Um, in terms of the second part, you know, the philosophy of difference. There, there are different people talking about it. I think Zhang Taiyan sort of anticipates some of this. Um, but I think the question of imperialism is more more serious because many people say, well, now we're 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 in a post-imperial stage and so on. And I think we really need to think about uh, about that. I think I don't think we're in a post-imperial stage, um, but I think that imperialism has been reconstituted in a way that is a little different from Zhang Zhang's period. Um, but the same issues are there, right? I think we still have imperialism and modernization theory. We've got something like America. I think we have American imperialism, which is which is obviously not about direct colonization, but it often uses the discourses of democracy and so on um, to 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 develop and, and, and that kind of imperialism. So that so that the kind of deconstructive gesture that that Jiang Taiyan is developing is, is is worth thinking about. The other thing that I think is 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 very important today is, is India China, and this again Patricia was talking about. Um, I mean, again, we have India-China sort of split um, in, in, a, in a certain way, perhaps you know more than they ever were. Um, but um, but at the same time, this split has to be analyzed in relation to imperialism um, because of the you know the present Indian government and the relation to the United States. 
I think is clear is, is clearly an issue, just like with the China-Japan relations. Um, you know, Abe and, and, and the U.S. connection. So I think, so that in some sense, we have to re rethink um, a lot of, um, if we're trying to think about Yang for the present in some ways, we, we'd have to rethink about how, how this, the imperialism constitutes our world and how the, the project of creating a, a, a kind of a, a vision beyond our present um, is still res relevant um, uh, to our contemporary world. And I'll, and I'll end with that. Well, uh, thank you very much. That was uh, very rich, very dense, and highly theoretical, <laughs> philosophical. So uh, who would like to uh, uh, jump in with a comment uh, or a question to the speaker? Yes, please. Uh, do, do give your name. Is that better? Yeah, yeah. of course. Okay. So the question is that does imperial mind, for example, you ended on imperialism. So we are still stuck with the imperial mind and also with the media being influenced by the imperial mind. So where is or is there any room left for any other mind to equate it, to question it, to doubt it, or to deliver it? Doubted or deliberate? Yes. I, I mean, my, my first response to that would be, I hope so. Um, and, and I think there is. I think, I think this is where um, both imperialism and capitalism, I've been, I've been very interested in recent theories of, of, of both of these. Um, and uh, I think there's, there's a theory of incomplete subsumption. Uh, and, I, and I think I am. Uh, very much in that, uh, very very sympathetic to that theory that, that imperialism can never completely subsume um, subjectivity, uh, and I think that is where one one can always come back. I mean, and part of what 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 Zhang Hayan is doing. I mean, the, there is the the possibility of of reexamining the discourses that again might open a space for for critique, but also the experiences um, of, of of those who are imperialized, and and similar similarly with capitalism. I think this has been. This has been a debate more amongst uh, amongst various Marxists as well. I mean, that where you have the Marxists who say, well, you know, capital is just like Hegel's spirit; it envelops everything. Right? So that then then it becomes the, the idea of resistance becomes hard to think. Of course, then but then and then that can lead to a I don't want to say modernization theory, but but like a modernization theory like type of response. That the only thing we can actually do is we have to wait. For for capitalism itself to undergo these cap contradictions, and then and then we can we can overcome it. Um, but but I I think that I don't think that capital is like um, like Hegel's spirit, and, and, and or neither neither did, did Hegel. But and and I don't think even Marx did. But but there's there's a certain group that now sees because and and, and this kind of discourse um, is something that I can understand why it's so popular. Because if you think about the period of Zhang Tanyan is really a period where there's still some hope. I mean, it's the beginning of the 20th century. He's meeting in Japan. There are all these socialists. Um, even though they're being totally oppressed and su suppressed, it's not a period where, when you talk about socialism, people say, well, we did that. And, and it becomes the hardest that nobody in, in, in the early 20th century can say, we did that, and we killed a bunch of people, and do you want to do that again? Um, with, them, with them, it was really the future was much more open. Well, now ideologically we are we are in a kind of stalemate. Uh, it's become and this is a, it's become very difficult to have visions of going beyond the future, uh, or going beyond the present, right? or or beyond the future that is dictated by the present. Right? Yes, please. Would you like to come forward to the mic? Use the mic. Yeah, there's a mic Since this is a bold discussion, and we seem to be, at least imagining, despite the reality today of Japan, China, China, Japan, India, India, China relations, we still can think of something Japan, China, India together do. 
why not be bold as still and include cultures or countries like Iran, Turkey? Why restrict Japan, China? I think I would to be very, very much sympathetic to that comment. Um, I think part of because part of the reasons because I went in from Jiang Taiyan that 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 his discourse is not that sympathetic to Islam. Um, and I think it's a problem with a lot of Pan-Asians. Um, Which is why I mentioned this. Yeah, I mean, and, and notice the people he, the Indians he hangs out with, are also fairly pro-Hindu pro uh, and not too, too pro-Islam. So that's why, I was, that's why I'm curious if Bar Barakatullah was actually there, because he would be an odd, odd one out, who was part of a Pan-Islam movement. Um, now, I, I'm writing a book on Pan-Asianism where I do have some Japanese intellectuals who are very pro-Islam. Um, the one person um, who I should mention is uh, Okawa Shumin. I don't know if you've heard of him. So he is, uh, was, a, was a close collaborator with Rash Bihari Bose. And he's one of the, he's the first translator of the Quran into Japanese. Uh, and he really had an idea of, in the beginning, Asia is including Judaism, um, Islam, you know, Confucianism, all these, and all these, the usual. But what's also interesting is he ends up supporting Japanese imperialism. So that became a big problem. I mean, there are a number of problems. But the, the Judaism became a problem after the Palestine issues, right? So that, then that fell out of Asia. But then by the time you get to the post, uh, the post-war, Okawa Shume is someone who ends up being a bad guy, and which is one of the reasons I want to go back to him, because I want to go back to him and say, well, you know, he's a, he's a right-wing guy, but some of what he says is really interesting about Asia. That is pr precisely with the question of, of, of Islam, for example. Uh, and, but there will be a question of how we bring that in today, because, again, that, that opens up a, num a number of other issues. I have a request actually, perhaps you'd like to dwell a little on the significance of Zantian's thought today, meaning that if one were to survey or review China in a post Tiananmen context, post-89, yeah. yeah. is there any sense that there is any resonance or any kind of resurrection of this and if you would care to sort of even outline what is Xi Jinping's view of Asian solidarity or any kind of Asian empathy if there is such a construct? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I, I know there's a, there's, a, there's a student here who's actually working on one, one belt, one road, so we should probably get him into the um, into the, uh, the, the discussion. But uh, I, I put it this way, it's actually it's a question obviously that came to my mind when I was writing the Zhang Taiyan book. Uh, and because when I went to China in, to do research for the book a long time ago, I think it was about 2002, and I go to bookstores and say, ask them if they have books on Jiang Taiyan. And, uh, or, do you have, or do you have, or I said, do you have something on Jiang Taiyan? And uh, he would, they would be like, so what kind of songs did he sing? <laughs> you know, so, so, so that there is a total amnesia of, about some of this. Now, there is a period if you, if you, and so this is 2002, but then I look back and you look at the Jiang Taiyan reception, there is, because he's such a multifaceted person, that there is a period in the 70s when Mao was really promoting Jiang Taiyan. And in fact, a lot of the materials I got were these, uh, some of these books that were re-edited by Mao, because Mao was very interested in criticizing Confucianism. And one of the things Jiang Taiyan does in, in, in a one period of his life is criticize Confucianism. And so he became part of that whole, that whole campaign. He promoted legalism. Now, that's a whole other issue. There's another way in which Zhang Taiyin is, is making a comeback, and that's because he was a nationalist. And Xi Jinping, you know, he might draw on that. The reason why he might not is Zhang Taiyin is not that easy to read. Um, so he's not... <laughs> so he's not someone who you try to... So Mao sort of tried that and tried to make like easy readers. But Zhang Taiyin, if you read Zhang, Zhang Taiyin, he's one of those people who, I don't know if, if I can think of a contemporary equivalent. Maybe, maybe someone like Jacques Derrida. You know, that someone that's there are times where he's, he's trying to do 
technic words that uh, that nobody's used, and he puts them in there for, for, you know, on purpose. And so, he, the, if you don't have a dictionary, even a Chinese is not going to be able to read them. So that's another way in which you know I don't think he's going to. That's going to. That's going to. Quite, it's, it's going to quite pick up. But the rest, the next part of the question was really the question of Pan Asianism, and 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 I think that Xi Jinping. You know, some people say the One Belt, One Road is going to be something like a, a it could be a Pan-Asianism, although it includes Europe and all these, all these things. I think there's a big difference, though. Um, because, remember, with we, when we came to the Pan-Asianist is really Takeuchi. John Tayin is a Pan-Asianist for a blip. And then he, you know, then he, has, he goes, because then the, the Republican Revolution happens and everything is reconstituted. Takeuchi Yoshimi, who's going to be the center of the, the, the book I'm writing, is uh, is really a Pan Asianist for the whole of most of his all of his life, um, but we have to remember that he's a Pan Asianist in the third world context, um, where the idea of third worldism makes sense, and um, and the, and the idea of socialism makes sense. Now, what's interesting with uh, with Xi Jinping, of course, and, and and this is I've been in China this year, and it's, it's been very weird because. I was invited to the People's University to give a talk on on something. They said, talk about China in the future. And it's a bunch of people, they said, they're going to be party officials there, so you know, make sure the talk is not something that they find is offensive. So okay, so I thought, okay, what could I talk about that they won't find offensive? So I, and, and that I that I and that also won't be a waste of my time. Um, so then I thought, okay, there's one thing that I'm sure they will not object to. And I thought I'll talk about American imperialism. And so I talk about American, I talk about Mao, American imperialism, and I tried to talk about you know the way in which you could talk about American imperialism being reconstituted. And I thought that would open a window for them to say, oh yeah, you know, one belt, one road is really resistance to me. They were very upset. So they said, you can't use the term imperialism right now. Uh, we prefer that you do not use that term. Uh, notice that in all of Xi, Xi Jinping's speech, speeches, he almost never uses the term imperialism. So he goes, why are you using the term imperialism when Xi Jinping doesn't even use the term imperialism? And I, I was not sure how, because that, that, that took me by surprise. Of course, now when you think about it, you know why. Because it's, they don't want anyone to have that idea in their mind. Um, that, because then, then you could say China's imperialist. Uh, and so they want to say imperial. So they, so this, so they totally dovetail with the the American kind of post-imperial. There's no imperialism anymore, uh, and I think that is what's really changing things. I mean, so unless the Xi Jinping thing takes a turn somewhere, I don't see Xi Jinping going in, in this in this direction. <laughs> starting off again from the Gary Deshika uh, essay. Um, he said that uh, uh, the idea of Asia was the other of the other, meaning the other of the West. Mm -hmm. that, that was the basic idea that Asia was, uh, that was behind Pan-Asianism in whatever form. It was just one comment. But um, what I wondered is whether you had, um, you know, you, what you've done here is you've dealt with a Chinese thinker who was uh, anti-Manchu, who was in dialogue with Japanese intellectuals, who were in dialogue with Hegel. But did you, uh, did you look at the vast amount of pan-Asianism uh, 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 emanating from different figures in India who had their different take. Uh, I mean, whether it was anti-imperialism uh, anti or um, and what, what was it, or whether it was cultural, like Tagore perhaps, uh, which fell flat when he came to realize that Japan and China was actually an aggressor against China and so on, or whether it was political. Uh, like Nehru, 
who carried it through to the Asian Relations Conference and saw India as uh, the uh, epitom uh, epitomization of, uh, or the leader in producing pan-Asianism um, in one way or another, um, but not necessarily using the philosophical basis, of, for instance, of Buddhism as like India's gift to the world or anything like that, but in terms of uh, anti-imperialism, uh, new nation states and that sort of thing, and how that idea fell flat. I mean, if you put into the China-Japan, uh, China-Japan, then if you put India into the equation and all the thinking about Pan-Asianism and the different versions and the different histories as these personalities change their views, where, where, how would one rank the difference? <coughs> yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I think at this point, the one Indian who may be the closest um, to what I'm doing, I guess, is Rash Bihari Bose. Uh, is Rash Bihari Bose. Because um, he was so openly pan-Asianist um, and, um, and really pro-Japanese in some sense. I mean, and, and, and that, I guess we could also bring Subhash Chandra Bose into this, um, although I, he's not a central part of the, the present project. But I think that would be what the, the place where you really have the Indians sort of getting into the, the East Asian discourse of, 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 of Pan-Asianism and developing a critique of the West and Western culture. Now, Nehru is somewhat interesting, and, I, and I'm not quite sure how to, how to deal with it. Um, because on the one hand, you're right. You can say, yeah, there is this anti-colonial, there is a kind of Asian thing. But there's also um, what some people would say is a kind of a kind of modernization narrative. Um, which so much of this pan-Asianism is supposed to be going against. So, so that is where um, that is where Takeuchi also. But Takeuchi writes about Nehru, and you know what they try to do is take only the anti-colonialism without the the, the the modernization. I mean, so so this is where. Yeah, I mean, I guess clearly the Bandung moment we have to talk about, um, and what happens there, and, what, and 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 the relationship between India and the Soviet Union would be the other, because really the the pan-Asianism in the post is connected with third worldism which is very connected to going beyond the US Soviet Union opposition um, and I guess that's but that's only that's one part of it and the other is the critique of modernization which is where it's a, which is where the Maoist dimension comes in um, and so here there's clearly a lot to be done with this because then we'd have to talk about Nehru Mao and the Nehru Mao connection but at the, but at the back of all of this is Gandhi who represents, who the, the, the Pan-Asians are much more happy with him. Because there you see much more of the, the, the critique that becomes much clearer. And I don't know, I haven't started, I'd have to look at to see to what extent he has a, he has definitely a critique of Western civilization. I wonder to what extent you could say he has a Pan-Asian But the uh, other question is the sources of their reflection. Um, just to quote again this essay that yeah. I just read. Well, I should be uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Nehru's uh, understanding of the history of humanity was from Toynbee, for instance. Yeah, yeah, which was uh, you, you know, so uh, not from uh, civilizational resources. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the, the person that one might look for in that connection might be someone who's peculiar as Benoit Kumar Sakar. Uh, yes. What about a personality like that? Yes. Who traveled all over the world, and uh, including in China, including in Japan, uh, continually bouncing off philosophical ideas from different civilizations themselves. Um, you know, so I think uh, unless you put India back into the picture, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Where, where it's a, a slightly one-handed club, Yes, I think I think. I or in incestuous <coughs> dialogue. Yeah, no, I yeah. think I think what's interesting with you is what you're basically saying is make it more, not just India as method, but actual India, and I think that is the, that is the issue. And I think, but I think, um, the way I look at much of what you're saying is it's, it's 
like someone like um, Sakar, I haven't, I haven't really delved into him in great detail. But a number of people have brought this up, and, and he could be a possible further project. Um, I would have to, because I think it would be very interesting from a comparative perspective. I don't think they're quite the same, it's the same discourse of Asia, but it could be a, another discourse that is critical of the West, even if it's not Pan-Asian. Because, I mean, I'm obviously interested in Pan-Asianism, not just because it's Pan-Asian, but, but because it, it represents a kind of critique of uh, um, capitalist modernity and, and so on, and, and develops, you know, what someone like Takeuchi was, saw as the problem with Marxist discourse in, in Japan, because they said that it's, it's, it's too teleological, and yet at the same time developing a kind of uh, keeping the, the socialist idea. Um, so, so I think what I could say is, I mean, I should, you know, definitely educate myself more on, 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 on these kinds of things. And all the rest of this process. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would anyone like to uh, come, come in on Sir, yes, please. Do you think this uh, China as a method has a better impact on uh, India, India, on India in particular as a method, looking to the domestic and international politics with reference to the business interest and other uh, interests? So, I guess. Um, the question would be how we look at business, um, and um, and how we would want to deal with that. Because I think often when we talk about India-China relations, um, a number of people are saying, "Yeah, well, they, they should get really good now because after all, there's so much business going on between them." Um, but I think that in itself. Um, isn't quite what either India's method or China's method is trying to do. Um, because we have to realize that India's method and China's method both are trying to posit a different type of worldview. Right? So that it's not just about, uh, and, and, and part of the problem might primarily be the, 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 the very vision of, the, of, of business itself, as, as business as an end in itself. Right? So that if you could make the argument that through this, these interconnections with business, maybe something else is going to develop you know, a new type of, of unity, then, then it begins to approach a little more um, China as, as, as method. Because like, the key, as we saw with Mizoguchi, because that's a Mizoguchi phrase um, that came out in 1989, which is really about developing a new kind of worldview, right? a worldview that doesn't take uh, the West as the center or, or Europe as the center. And, and by extension, we could say that, that doesn't take capitalism as the center. Now, that gets very tricky because um, there are those, uh, I forget who the, the, the two theorists were, who talk about the end of capitalism as it, as it exists or something like that, I forget the name. Um, but, um, you know, they try to argue we should stop thinking about capitalism because, you know, we don't want to be capitalocentric. That, I think, is, is a little dangerous because there's actually so much going on in, in the world that you're not going to make sense with, uh, without the term, uh, without capitalism. But, there is the idea of the hope for a world beyond capitalism. And, and in that sense, it is the idea of as method is, is saying that the capitalist, imperialist world is one that does not allow difference. And that something like India as China's method and China's method are going to have to be in, are going to have to confront that in some way. Yeah, so. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, please. Uh, how much of this idea of pan Asianism is Western? And second question, uh, how much it is based on differences and how much of similarity? Well, so the, the, the idea of being Western, again, I think is what uh, Patricia was saying as well, which is that Say, you can say it's Western, but uh, I mean, in the sense that it started, there was no concept of Asia before the West. Right? But um, the idea of Pan Asianism itself, I wouldn't say is Western, because it's only the people in Asia who developed this idea in order to, to, to formulate a critique. Right? Um, so 
it's mediated by the West, but I wouldn't want to say it's only Western, because the, the most famous people who, who are developing it are not, are, are not Western. It's very much a kind of critique of imperialism, but it wouldn't be there if there weren't imperialism in the first place. And that Jiang Taiyan sort of says too, right? He says at first, and this is his ideal situation, you, do, you have all these different kind of um, nations, but you don't really have uh, you don't really have the unity. The unity comes after imperialism, right? And that's so, so so that that's so it's Western mediated, but I wouldn't call it Western. Do, do you see what do you see the difference? The distinction that I'm making. Uh, one other question: the uh, period that you're dealing with. Yeah. Uh, particularly uh, the post-war period in yeah. China. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, Kang Wei yeah, yeah. and his student Yang Chi Chao was yeah, an important yeah. inter uh, person on the intellectual yeah, horizon yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, was a host of Tagore, I think, in, when he went to China. But there, were also, there was also a huge debate went on in the early 20s uh, uh, under the title of Eastern and Western Cultures and Their Differences. Yeah. I think the author was Yang, uh, Liang Xuming, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And in this, they had East, uh, Eastern culture, uh, uh, they really had a triad of uh, the West, China, and India, in which China and India were opposed. India yeah. was the, the bad side of the Chinese character. And you often get the feeling that this is how China looks at India even today, as part of the, their uh, civilization or their traditions, which they would rather do without. Uh, anyhow, that debate on where India, there's no Pan-Asianism, it's China uh, without, uh, China leading, not India, whereas Nero was had India leading, uh, all the rest coming from India. Yes, I think I think so. That there are many versions of that. I think I think the whole you could say the the period of Bandung and so on. The many would argue it's it's really China and India fighting about you know who's who's going to be the the, the leader um, of of the third world. With respect to the India China, um, you know, as early as Liang Xuming, it there he actually wants to develop a synthesis of all of them, um, of, and even the West. I forget now what exactly it was. He says, I think, the Indians, there's, they're, I think, too complacent or something, and, and, or something like that. And even if you look at Okakura attention, India becomes an, is an in, in, important part of the synthesis, right? He says, the Vedas are individualism, and the Confucianism is communism, and you have to bring them together. So, so, that's right. um, so, you, so you have that kind, of, uh, that, that kind of idea. I think India being, uh, something we want to get rid of, uh, I see much more. It's, it's rarer as a, as, a, as a Chinese narrative. Um, if, if they're going to stress the Indian roots of Chinese culture, those are probably people who are going to try and develop some, some kind of connection. Unless, of course, they're modernization theorists. Because usually, those who want to get rid of Indian culture, they'll also want to get rid of Chinese culture. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, so Kang Youwei is a good example. Because Kang Youwei is a modernization theorist. Remember, he's arguing to reform in China, too. Now, of course, that doesn't mean get rid of Chinese culture in the way that you can get, and even Buddhism. You really like Buddhism. But the key is you, you can't be like in India and, don't, and, and not modernize. So up to the later period, like take the communist um, period, uh, where Mao, India is often there and saying, you know, you want to try capitalism? Well, you're going to end up like India. So that kind of issue, right? So in fact, they'd often say, hey, you've got beggars in the street in India. You think we have it bad here, but you know, it's really not that bad. You know? so, that, so that India, and that's why you had all those Raj Kapoor movies in, the, in, in China, right? So, so you, well, you, most Chinese can sing Avarahu in Chinese, right? So, so, um, so the, 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 the reason why that is the case is because you have this idea that, oh, this is a poor guy, and so on, look, this is a representation of, of, of India, right? So, so that India, in that sense, when it's bad, it's usually not because of its traditions, but it's because it didn't modernize. So it's, there's a modernization narrative in which India has been put, um, you know, it was colonized and so on. Maybe they'll also talk about the caste system, in which case, but then that has nothing to do with China. So, it's, it's, so the things that had something to do with China 
they usually say, yeah, it's good, and we actually even made it better. Okay. Just like the Japanese said, they, we took the Indians and the Chinese and we made it. Okay, well, uh, maybe I have a different opinion on that. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we talk over, over yeah, yeah. tea. Yeah. Any, any other questions or comments? Uh, then I, I think we uh, say thank you for uh, a very, very interesting uh, uh, talk. Um, uh, I think it, it was quite mind-opening. We'll look out for your books and your future books as they come. Uh, the other piece of uh, thinking I did before I uh, uh, came here was to resurrect an ICS publication called Narratives of Asia from Asia, meaning, uh, yeah. you know, Asia, uh, from India, Japan, and China, including a lot of reflections of, of different people on, on Pan-Asianism. And uh, that was authored by uh, uh, by Madhavi Tunkin oh, okay. and by Bridge Tunker. Oh. Bridge Tunker, uh, you know, oh, the, the number one, and uh, Madhavi Tunkin. So um, this has taken us back to a few years, to yes. earlier work of our uh, colleagues, and I think we can keep up the dialogue a little, a little bit more. So thank you very much for a very uh, publisher. Um, some park publications, if you prefer, 2005. Uh, a fairly rare book these days. Yeah. We'll work hard to get it. Congratulations. <laughs> So uh, thank you, everyone. We believe the tea is downstairs. Okay, thank you very much.